enjoy Tornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in on this episode of the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik, and across the table today, I have senior ballistician Jaden Quinlan and lead lab technician Matt George. Guys, thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. No trouble. So I pulled you guys out of the ballistics lab uh, to have a little bit of a discussion on reloading data. You know, the Hornady Handbook of Cartridge Reloading has been a staple for, I think, man, the last six decades, right? You've got all these reloaders that have that manual in some form uh, that they reference for lengths and charge weights and primer recommendations, and not to mention the first hundred and so whatever pages of good ballistic information in there on external ballistics and internal ballistics and uh, loading techniques and processes. A lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of man hours go into that manual. And that manual is now available conveniently on your phone, uh, the Hornady Reloading app. But not as many people that use it understand how that data gets there and how that data is generated. And is it one guy, you know, in the, in the dark dungeon just shooting over and over and over and over and over again? And if we do develop low data for one bullet and one powder, do we just apply that to all of them? Or how does it work within the same bullet weights? And so I want Matt George specifically to really uh, expound on what that means for us and how we do it. And then uh, I want to answer the question that we get a lot of the time, which is, you got our data in our reloading manual, and somebody grabs another reloading manual, and the data is different. Why is it different? And which one do you believe? And uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. So to start, Matt, walk us through, you know, uh, let's say 7PRC, for example, a new cartridge for us last year. Okay, we have brass. Now you have to develop load data. What do you do to get from you have brass and you have bullets and you have powder to finish data? printed in a manual step one with with compiling the data is is pressure testing we do all of the pressure testing the uh, 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 primarily we're looking for the, the peak pressure the maximum aver- average pressure uh, those pressures are established by sammy sporting arms and ammunition manufacturers institute mm-hmm. and what they do is they establish the guidelines what is the safe pressure level for a cartridge like the 7 prc uh, we want to make sure that our data if you look in the the tables the red box is the maximum charge you're going to want to put in that cartridge um, a lot of people say hey that's that's just there that's what the lawyers say the maximum is yeah. lawyers don't do any ballistic testing they don't have any idea what the industry specs are that's what it is we will load to the top end safe pressure level mm-hmm. uh, that's the limit that is our, our yeah. pressure budget i think we get that all the time you guys have been trade shows camp perry you name it Oh, that's, you know, the lawyers have you back off of that by two or three or four or 5% or whatever. But you're saying, Mm -hmm. heard it here, what we print in that red box, that Mm -hmm. is the charge that achieved the maximum average pressure allowable. Yep. And that is, that's the do not exceed. Okay. A lot of people say, Hey, this is, this is looking good. Bolt lifts nice. Primers are nice and round. I'm going to put another grain in here to see if I can get it, you know, another 20 feet per second out of this. Don't do it. Okay. Um, When we do all of our pressure testing, we do it with minimum spec chambers minimum bore and groove in the barrel. And by that you should get, that's going to make the highest possible pressure. Mm. Um, some of the gun manufacturers, they might be all over with their dimensions. Maybe you could get away with, with fudging a little bit. I'm going to say no. I would say that red box, that's your stopping point. Uh, always you want to start below that, 10, 20% underneath that. You don't have to go too crazy. You don't want to go to the bottom end of those tables. To start, yeah. that's a bit excessive. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that right there. Is So we have a minimum charge weight or the starting charge. Mm. Is that a true minimum? And why wouldn't you recommend going below what's listed as the minimum? Usually that minimum, uh, depending on the, what the cartridge is, you know, it might be a two or 300 feet per second below the max in a rifle cartridge. Uh, usually that's that's just a good safe point. Might have a lot to do with just the, the, the void in the cartridge case, you know, that empty space, the ullage. Mm-hmm. as that's called, um, that where your, your powder has room to move forward and backwards, and that really messes with the variation from shot to shot. Uh, velocity. Okay. Mm-hmm. And Jaden, talk to us a little bit about how that can increase pressure, which seems super counterintuitive where you get a low charge weight, 
but you end up with a high pressure situation. Sure. What yeah. goes on there? Well, going going too low can be a safety concern. So as you drop your charge weight within a fixed cartridge and bullet combination, uh, pressure is going to drop as a function of that. Well, one of the mechanisms of pressure generation and, and the way the propellant burns is the pressure itself. And so the more pressure that's present at the time that the propellant is burning, the faster it's going to burn. And the inverse is true. Okay. The less pressure that's present, the slower it's going to burn. So if you go too far down, what you can have happen is the the primer goes off, uh, goes through the flash hole, hits the back of the propellant bed, starts to burn the propellant. Enough pressure is generated from either the primer or the initial burn of the propellant to get the bullet to start to move. Once the bullet starts to move, the volume is increasing behind it, and that's going to cause pressure to drop if, if it was a static pressure generation. Um, but as the bullet starts to move, if the pressure's level, level, level drops low enough, a uh, bullet essentially hits the resistance of the forcing cone or the rifling or the throat, however you want to term it. Um, and now, as the pressure begins, it's still burning, right? You still have pressure generation. But as that continues, now the volume is kind of fixed because the bullet has come, come to a stop in the rifling. And now the engraving forces are dramatically higher. The bullet's not just leaving the, the, the resistance uh, of the case neck. It's now jumped all the way forward and it's hitting the engraving point in the barrel and pressure can go way, way up. Uh, this is where, and, and as you go to the extreme end of that, that's where you get into like delayed ignition and hang fire type stuff that mm. we can definitely see in the lab if we give it the, the correct set of components. Yeah. Okay. So that makes sense. The propellant is progressive burning and it, like people say, takes money to make money. It takes pressure to generate pressure. If that drops too low and the bullet, now the engraving forces doesn't have enough pressure to really engrave. Mm -hmm. So you've fixed the combustion chamber, essentially, mm -hmm. but you're still burning the propellant. Now you're going to get that dramatic pressure spike. Yeah, and I, I almost did that. The first round I ever reloaded, I remember, it was like 12 or 13, and I was I was just in fear of blowing this thing up, right? This whole concept yeah. of reloading is scary. Like, I've never done this before. Um, back then, data was super limited. Like, you had that book, and that was it. And a, and a more limited version of that book. Sure. You know, there was not nearly as much stuff in there as there is now, but I remember I, I wanted to go even lower. Like my thought process was, well, max is over here on the right. So the farther I get from that, the better it is. And that's not true. It's more of like a U shape, right? Like, yeah. yeah, you're getting safer and safer and safer. And now you're getting less and less and less safe as you continue to go down. Yeah. So Almost ended up with a thirty out six uh, with a with a bullet in it. That would have been yeah. Well, that would have been a two two three. No, oh, okay. First one, yeah. Look at this. A hundred free bullets when I buy these select Hornady reloading tools. Wow, five hundred free bullets with certain Hornady reloading presses and kits. Well, what do they have? Let's get loaded. There's no better time to stock your reloading bench. Choose from the most durable, precise, and convenient tools on the market and receive free bullets to get you loaded. Visit Hornady.com for further details. Next time we get loaded, come by and... All right, so Matt, you said to get started, we start with a pressure and velocity barrel and we purposefully select manufacturers that can deliver us min-spec bore and groove and min-spec chamber reamers and and properly reamed and we get barrels from a bunch of places but for P V barrels man we really lean on bartland really hard i know proofs in the game now hs precision uh, but really high quality stuff and the dimensions and the tolerances are are key because we want them to be as tight as possible so that by the time you put that load data in a factory rifle now it's safer because you're probably not facing min boring groove plus min chamber mm -hmm. so you start with that pressure barrel, you pick a cartridge, you pick the bullet, uh, pick a primer kind of at random that fits in large rifle magnum, standard large rifle, uh, what have you. And then how do you, you work it up? You just start kind of random and poke holes or you start high and work low? You, you got to use some intuition. So okay. what we do in the lab, you know, on the rest of the day when we're not doing stuff like handbook data is we're just doing production testing. And you see a lot of the same cartridges that you're going to do your, your load data with throughout the day just testing off a machine sure so a lot of that intuition that you will build when it comes to doing the load data is is pretty much at the uh gets yeah. in line behind yeah production it's like testing. tribal knowledge or it's just you're you guys are active users you shoot you reload you've been mm -hmm. reloading a, obviously a long yep. time so you just kind of have that background knowledge yep. of mm -hmm. about this charge weight of about this 
burn speed of propellant, mm-hmm. and then you can see how yep. it does. Yep. And you're gonna you're gonna start with a whole feed of pow- uh, uh, a field of powders that the burn rate is is roughly about where we're loading our, our factory ammo with, and then we'll just go through every one of those powders and just kind of guess a charge weight. That's you know it's a nice case fill. Uh, you want to just be able to seat that bullet nice and easily without wringing it. Because there are some powders where you can you could get more performance out of a powder if you could get more powder in the case. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's one you kind of got to back off for. But we'll just go through, guess on a on a powder charge, and you can. I mean, if we were going to use a hydrogen powder, we're going to use a Winchester powder, and we'll go through and, and maybe look at what they're doing mm-hmm. with with some of our bullets because they shoot our bullets as well. Sure. Um, and that kind of gives us a, a good idea too, if, especially when we're starting completely cold on something like a seven PRC. Yeah, got it. So you work it up till you achieve that maximum pressure. And that kind of sets the baseline then of how many propellants are going to work. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things that I thought was interesting was I just, as a consumer of our products and of our reloading data, you just assume like, oh, it's a large manufacturer. They've got all the powders all the time. And when it comes time to shoot reloading data, we're kind of limited in some instances of what powders we actually have on hand to use. Mm-hmm. How has that been uh, a problem in the last five years or so? Yeah, a lot of it is powder availability, especially if there's something new. I mean, there's a lot of hot powders out there that people really, really love to get a hold of that they're just, it's spread pretty thin. And so for us to get it in, usually it, it takes a favor. Mm-hmm. You know, the manufacturer would love to have our, our, their powders in our manual and we'd love to have, have their yeah. powders in our manual as well. Um, so, so, you know, working with, with a cooperative of, of manufacturers and, and, and getting together and you know, and getting stuff yeah. and finding, finding the optimal powders that, that we want to put in that manual. I think about when Reloader 26 and Reloader 16 hit the market, you know, that was, gosh, I don't know when, uh, probably 2016, let's say. Mm-hmm. And I feel like Reloader 16 was the initial like, oh, yeah, everybody wants Reloader 16 because it works so great in a Creed more and the Hot Rod 6s that were getting popular in the PRS world and that kind of stuff. And then it was like, oh man, Reloader 26 is some sort of magic fairy dust. It works amazing in so many different things. And then, you know, we printed a manual, I think 2018 or 19 time frame. And I've heard like, what, you know, why is there not more Reloader 26 in the applicable cartridges? Man, there, there was a time in there where, oh, Reloader 26. Yeah, that's a cool story. Never seen it. Uh, and that's still a problem today. So yeah, we, we have a lot of friends in a lot of places, but sometimes simply getting propellant to put in the manual is a problem and it you know might take two three four maybe five six seven pounds to get it sprinkled in uh to all the applicable cartridges but sometimes it's just not feasible Mm -hmm. so uh there's an ongoing recycling of the data that needs to be reworked and and new powders added to it but uh sometimes it's not that easy you know look at the new winchester line of propellants with the stay ball match stay ball hd uh to complement their stay ball six five um, I think we just got some of that in. If we did. Excellent. So when we print the next edition, mm-hmm. you'll be on the lookout for that. It might be in there. Yep. Uh, so you go through the do that. Let's say you pick uh, a bullet weight. Uh, let's in seven millimeter, let's say 139 grains. So you've got 139 grain bullet. Well, you've got 139 grain CX, 139 grain interlock, uh, boat tail spire point, uh, SST and an inner bond, right? So you've got half a dozen different bullets. Which bullet do you choose to work the data up with? Uh, because the same charge weight table is present with all bullets. Um, do you do based on availability or do you go with monolithics or how do you decide that? Yeah, a lot of those traditional cup and core style bullets will go through and maybe select which one would be the most popular for, for that, that uh, class of, of bullet weight. Uh, say with a 7 millimeter, maybe 139 grain spire point just because we sell tons of them. I mean, everybody loves that bullet. They're, they're really popular. Uh, that bullet also is is not dimensionally, maybe constructively a little bit different, but pretty darn close to an SST. Mm-hmm. So we can we can put an SST, SST and a spire point together. Uh, if there's maybe something like a round nose bullet, usually a round nose bullet is is farther out of the case, closer into the lead, mm-hmm. and maybe you, you can get a little bit higher pressure with a bullet of that style. Uh, we could maybe go go with something like that, and, and likely the data for that bullet is going to work with with the rest of them in that class. Okay. When you get into the CX style bullets or the DGS bullet, if there's a DGS uh, in that cartridge, uh, those pretty much need to be separately because the construction is so much different in those that they just 
they don't really yeah. seem to, to meld yeah. with those. And not ones. always the case, but no. certainly no. sometimes. No. And stuff like the uh, 30 cal and uh, the 150 grain CX, it's pretty darn close. I mean, it's it's a nice length bullet for yeah. its weight. I mean, it's a little bit heavier because it's it's a monolithic. Uh, but as far as getting into the, the 180 grain, you're you're off the board. You need to you yeah. need to shoot separate data for that one. Yeah. Yep. Or shoot that data for that bullet and then apply that to the cup and core style bullets if they're in the same yep. table. Yep. You could do that. Okay. Awesome. So that seems easy enough, but when you look at the hundreds of pages of data and all of the cartridges and all of the propellant, the man hours to, to do this is, is quite remarkable. One question I have about velocity, right? So we have a charge weight with a velocity, and those are general velocities because barrels have attitude. So we do our pressure testing in the pressure barrel, obviously. Mm -hmm. Do you shoot that charge weights, those charge weights then through a rifle to achieve that velocity? Yep, we do. We, so when we establish our, our top end, our, our max charge, what we'll do from there is we'll break it down into uh, just gradual increments uh, working down from there. So maybe like a 7PRC, we would do maybe increments of five grains less than the max and do a few rounds through a rifle at that, those, those incremental charge weights. And, and based off of that, that's how we build those tables. Okay. So that's, that's neat to know, at least for our consumer to know that those, uh, in that manual, you'll see on the first page of the cartridge, it'll say what the test gun was. Mm -hmm. And so we're developing the data using a pressure barrel. We can tell you that, yes, this was this load achieved SAMI max average pressure and less, but to achieve the velocities, whatever that test gun is listed, that's the gun that was used and will provide the barrel length as well. Uh, and I think that just gives it more of a apples to apples approach to what the consumer is going to see in that manual. And and it resonates because a pressure barrel, again, min bore and groove. So you've got a really tight bore diameter and uh, compared to what you might have in the field. And so it just might not be as close to what you're going to experience. And I feel that that's, that's worthwhile. It's valid. I, th I don't know if there's many companies that do that. I don't know how everybody else develops data. But, uh, and if we only use a pressure barrel, if a gun's not available at that time, but we still want to develop the data, we'll put it right on there what the barrel length is and that it was a... Uh, pressure and velocity testing barrel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another good way to do it because yeah. we're doing it with our calibrated pressure test barrels and, and they're pretty solid in terms of their velocity. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything is within the limits established for industry, uh, whereas guns can be a little bit different from gun to gun, especially with something like 30 out 6 where we've, we've been using the same rifle for so long that it's toast. I mean, it's, yeah. it's easy if it's a 30 out 6 because you can always get another 30 out 6, but going back to like pistol car cartridges, where we had for the the nine millimeter Luger, we had uh, it was a Smith and Wesson model thirty seven. You know, we we finally did away with that maybe ten years ago. We're, <laughs> we're Glock seventeen now. Yeah, you know it's 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 getting with the times. Yeah, you got to try to make it uh, applicable to what people are going to see or, or what they're going to have. In the worlds of primers, do you guys see a ton of difference in what primers you guys select for the low data uh, by you know swapping primers? Do you see a ton of difference? pretty marginal yes and no it, it, there's no straight answer to that okay. um, generally a primer is picked that's going to be available and applicable and commonly used in that cartridge or, or application for that cartridge you know let's say a magnum versus a, a standard mm -hmm. um can primers make a huge difference a hundred percent yeah um but but it's t it's almost eclipsed by your lot of powder your rifle all of that stuff so sure. the that blanket initial statement of never start at max you know start start down at a moderate charge rate like matt was was talking about drop it you know 10 or 20 percent and start there that's to to safely encompass the variance in the primer you know we may have done it with a federal primer and you have a winchester or whatever yep. it may be yep i was going to reference this page but i didn't know if it was still on the same page number uh from the 10th edition to the 11th but on page 36 of our manual we have a table of all the boxer primers and kind of how they're classed, right? You know, small and large handgun, small and large handgun magnum. And then the same thing with rifle, small and rifle, uh, small and large, and then uh, magnum for each of those. And they have a table there so you can see, okay, if we develop with a Federal 215, the equivalent Remington Winchester CCI would be this. And uh, if you've developed a load that's right up there with max, you know, you don't want to just be plugging and playing with different primers because right. they can create a difference. But 
Um, I just wanted to call that out there because I know primers are, they're like chickens with lips out there right now. Sometimes, you know, there's just <laughs> don't exist. Yeah. It's uh, been a tough market for it. Yeah. Yeah, it has. The Hornady CX Copper Alloy Expanding Bullet. CX bullets feature the advanced heat shield tip that resists aerodynamic heating and provides a consistently high BC. Hard hitting and deep penetrating, CX bullets are constructed of rugged monolithic copper alloy that retains 95% or more of their original weight for devastating terminal performance. Available in factory loaded ammunition as well as component bullets for reloaders. CX bullets from Hornady. So shifting gears now from how we develop our data and what we do to develop that, uh, we get this question a lot at trade shows. We get it on the phones still in you know, our technical service team still gets this question where, man, there's a bunch of manufacturers out there. Hodgden, for example, they're the proprietors of Hodgden, Winchester, IMR, and now Western Powders, right? So they, they have lots of reloading data available and they give it out for free, which is great. But we get the call often where, I'm at Hodgson's Reloading Center on their website, and I'm looking at 308 Winchester data with 168 grain bullet, and I'm shooting yours, and I'm looking at max loads for Varget, and yours says 45 grains, and theirs says 46.2. Which one's right? And I would like to get your guys' official answer um, on why that's different and what you do in that situation. Well, my initial answer would be both are right. Yeah. Um. And that's within the the consideration of, of how that testing was generated. Just like Matt explained, I'm sure Hodgden is doing something similar down there. We know that they're using pressure and velocity test barrels. Hodgden actually will publish a pressure value for most of their stuff, yep. um, which some people like to see. But barrel to barrel to barrel, there's going to be differences. Even if dimensionally there, I mean, we see this constantly in the lab, right? We get a set of barrels in that were ordered at the same time from the same manufacturer, likely from the same batch of steel. They were manufactured with the same tooling. They're as identical as could be manufactured. And when we shoot those barrels with our reference ammunition to assess the state of the barrel against a control, the reference ammunition, they're not the same. And so just that fact alone that, you know, if we took our barrel and sent it to Hodgden or vice versa, and we used the exact same lot of powder and same lot of cases and same lot of primer and same lot of bullet, likely our data would be identical, but we don't, right? Hodgden is using a different barrel than we are. We might be using a different propellant lot, yeah. powder lot, or a primer lot, case lot. All those little intricacies can tolerance stack themselves to where maybe Hodgden got the high pressure version of all those, right? Their barrel was absolutely min-spec. They had the fastest lot of powder uh, with the bullet weight or the bullet tolerance weight and dimensional tolerance and the primer. All of those spec to make them produce High pressure, high pressure on all those categories. And then all of ours were low, right? Even though it was a min-spec barrel, it was towards the upper end of tolerance allowed in manufacturing and all those things. Yeah, you're going to see a separation in the data. Yeah. And the chamber reamer. 100%. Just simply what chamber reamer you used. How many guns is that reamer chambered? What the dimensions were at the time of cutting? How the steel took the cutting? Mm -hmm. uh, all those things, like you said, tolerance stack up on each other. And that can, can create... I've seen couple grains worth of different uh, max charge weights that are like, man, that's something's got to be wrong. And in some cases there has been misprints. Uh, but for the most part, all those things you mentioned are, are the reason. So like you said, both are right. They're just right for that specific set of, mm -hmm. of tooling. And I think that lends itself to the explanation of the essence of hand loading, like hand loading from the beginning, you know, like, custom tailoring something that you can't get right now uh, or you want better accuracy or better performance for your rifle that's the essence of hand loading in a nutshell and the max load is the max load in your rifle and you have to be the one that assesses where you're at looking at the available data and and getting to a spot where you feel comfortable and safe and everything operates well um, you take that responsibility as a hand loader and uh I think you said you, everybody says this all the time, but it doesn't seem like everybody listens, but when you start getting towards that maximum limit of what's published mm -hmm. and then you knowingly exceed it, your mileage will vary. Mm -hmm. and you might be able to do that for a lot of years and a lot of guns and have no problems. And then there will be a time where you won't. Yeah. You don't know where and when it's coming. Yeah. 
I would classify it too is when you look at that reloading, you know, our our cartridge reloading handbook or Hodgdon's website or Alliance website or whatever, those are not predictive tools. They're not meant to tell you what will happen if you replicate what is listed. It's it's a reference tool because you're you're yeah. doing something different, right? Your barrel is different. Therefore, we just went through the the Hornady versus Hodgdon example in those two of different data. By default, you would expect you having a different barrel and different brass and possibly a different lot of powder, you're going to get a different result. So it's a mm-hmm. reference tool. It's not a predictive tool. It's just meant to give you an idea of what you need to do on your end to make sure you're safe in the in the process of going through it. Got it. That's a good way to think of it. You know, Kind of like in one of our podcasts, you explained extreme spread of velocity and standard deviation of velocity. An extreme spread is not a predictive tool of what it will be. Mm-hmm. It's a reference tool of what it was correct uh, whereas standard deviation is more of a predictive uh metric i guess uh but that's a good way to think of it that reloading data is not predictive it is just a reference mm-hmm. and you try to be as savvy as possible mm-hmm. awesome well I, I feel like that i know it's kind of a shorter than our normal podcast but i feel like that although a little bit more brief gave a peek behind the curtain for our consumer and our hand loaders out there to, to see how we do it in the lab and to know that we're using real guns for velocity. We're measuring stuff for pressure. Our max loads achieved are actually the maximum loads. And like Matt, you said earlier, like there's no lawyers here that, that know what the performance metrics of SAMI are and are monitoring our load data. Yeah. Uh, but it gives a, a peek behind the curtain and I feel like Anytime you get a peek behind a curtain, we're trying to let more people in and trying to be transparent with what we're doing here as a company. And uh, I think that's only going to help things on just the customer company relationship or trust, I guess. So anything else to add on reloading data, uh, both on the why it's different or just how we develop it? I don't know. The best thing I could say on, on the, the pressure side of it is is you don't need to go to that red box. You might have a load that works better yeah. if you back it off a grain or grain, two grains. Um, that's just what we say the maximum is. That's that's not what you need to get that yeah. gun to We perform. said it's the maximum, yeah. not the best. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. That's absolutely true. You know, yeah. Some stuff shoots better 200 feet per second slower. Mm-hmm. A, a lot of the time it does. I mean, I see it constantly in R&D. Yeah. Just back off of pushing everything to the extreme, and it works better and more consistently. Out here... You may only get one chance. So never compromise. At any distance. Match accurate ELDX bullets, highest BCs, flat trajectories, and unparalleled terminal performance at all practical ranges. Precision Hunter Ammunition from Hornady. Excellent. Well, then we'll leave the reloading data portion there and we're going to shift gears because we do this every time Jaden you're off the hook I am yeah all right well what we, if my answer changed well we can't be doing no <laughs> nay nope uh your answer is your answer and I'm sure it has changed but uh and we were just on a podcast this morning for uh somebody else not not on the Hornady podcast and they asked a very similar question sure so I feel yeah, like we need the world needs to know what Matt George's answer is. So, Matt George, you have to pick one cartridge and one bullet for the rest of your life. Unlimited guns and limited ammo, but one cartridge, one bullet for everything you like to do as a shooter or defense or whatever. What are you picking? Through it, Winchester. Yeah. 762 NATO. 762 NATO. Mm-hmm. Now, that's a fine answer. And one Preston Lintford had a very similar answer. He said 308 Winchester as well after some careful consideration. It was even on my radar. Uh, before I pin you down on bullet, why do you choose the three weight Winchester? The, the versatility. The okay. thing is through the roof. I yeah. mean, you, you can you can do anything with it, whether it's a you know a, a short little single shot rifle, you know, or a, a belt fed light machine gun. It'll do it all. I mean, it's it's you can't think of anything you can't really do with it. There's a lot of things you probably shouldn't do with it, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just jack of all trades type cartridge. Yeah. Jack of all trades. Yeah, there are probably some things you shouldn't do with mm-hmm. it, but I guess when you put it that way, when Preston answered, we were thinking more, he can hunt elk with it, he can hunt here with it, obviously prairie dogs, coyotes, but he can shoot matches with it too. And I guess 
you know, it, it, do, it does fit in mm-hmm. the 242 <laughs> machine Yeah, gun. machine guns are kind of cool. Machine guns are super yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, good point. So between the single shot, the AR-10s, the bolt-action rifles, the machine guns, if you have to pick a bullet to go with it, what are you going to choose? My favorite bullet has always been the 178 Hotel Hull Point. Um, the Yield X mm-hmm. is a great bullet, too. I would probably have to pick the, the Botel Hall Point. Okay. Just the classic, you yeah. know, the, the match round when you look at something And like not that. a prolific hunter, Matt, I'm guessing. No. Nope, not into no. the hunting. Just you like to shoot. Uh, long range stuff's pretty cool. The military application, the uh, Camp Perry kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. So, a 308 Winchester with a 178 Botel Hall Point. Now, I will say, I know Jaden and I know myself have shot a lot of that exact combination right mm-hmm. there. Uh, when I started at Hornady, Jaden had already been here for probably a year or two, maybe a little, yeah, two years. And uh, I was putting together a 308 Winchester match rifle. He said, You got to shoot the 178. I was like, I was going to shoot 168 A tips. He said, No, you got to shoot the 178. A maxes back then. Or, yeah, not A tips, excuse yeah. me, A maxes. And uh, yeah, got some 178s, put it on top of a Varget. And it just shot lights out, and that's a great combination. The classic combination. I that's, like it. Yep, awesome. Well, you heard it here, guys. Matt George, uh, lead lab technician, 308 Winchester, 178 grain boat to hollow point. Jaden, are you having any, aren't any change of heart? Not that you can change it, but any change of heart now after hearing his answer? Well... There's there's things coming out in the world, so like zombie apocalypse was a big consideration of your original question on mm-hmm. whatever podcast that was. Yeah. But I keep hearing about like this AI apocalypse thing. Ooh. And I'm wondering, I don't know. We got to do some R and D holistically and see You're if thinking, there's an optimal. There probably is a digital version yeah. of the through eight Winchester one seventy eight Botel Hollow Point. You're picking up what I'm putting down. Dot JPEG. But we don't know yet. Okay. Yeah. I don't well, know how to code. <laughs> 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 uh, fair enough. I don't either. Uh, Jaden, I can guarantee you don't either. <laughs> no, we'll just stay in the kinetic world for now. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, guys. Well, before this devolves, I appreciate you guys, uh, you know, coming up out of the lab and explaining this to me, uh, to our consumer. Sure. Appreciate it, guys. Sure. Welcome. Guys, hopefully you enjoyed this podcast on reloading data, how we do it, how we achieve it, how it gets published, and then also why some manufacturers' data is slightly different than others. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll catch you on the next one.